Kevin Cooney, is the perfect guy to tell us the truth. He is the truth teller when it comes to this Phillies team. He will not hold back. If you read him over at phillyvoice.com, he will explain it to you right now on the Sports Pass Live on 97.3 ESPN. As he joins me here on a Wednesday where the Phillies won last night. So, Kevin, they want us to tell the good. They did win a game last night. They they won a game. Vince Velasquez looked halfway decent. That's about it. That's all we can talk about good with them right now because the bullpen's the best. And, you know, even, you know, Mike, I, 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 I keep trying to be positive that they can find a way to, 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 you know, get better and get in the hunt and make it an interesting August and September. And I keep, you know, batter, batting my head up against the wall thinking, you know, eventually you got to turn things over to the bullpen, and and that's where you know the game over is for this team right now. So, well, you wrote a couple of days ago about the fact that they know who they are. What are they? Are they a team that is just kind of trying to hang on to the middle ground here? Are they a team that is trying to fly by the seat of their pants? Are they a team that knows they're not very good but can't do anything about it because of Harper's contract? How would they describe themselves? I think they would describe themselves as that they have pieces, but in the end they know that their pieces are probably not good enough because their minor league system can't supply those pieces. I don't think it's just the Bryce Harper contract. I think it's simplistic to say, well, you're overextending yourself on Bryce Harper. And, you know, that's while the years I would agree they went too far out, but. You know, I don't think the annual value is, is prohibitive for a, a player of Brace Harper's talent. Um, you know, my my argument would be, if you're going to make that big move, then you better have other pieces in the minor league system, and they just don't have it. I mean, you know, look at look at them defensively. I mean, you know, they have a they have a third base, or they have a first baseman playing third. They have a designated hitter playing first. Um, yeah, you, know, you have a, a old center fielder playing left who who has no range anymore. Odubel's a mess. You know, Luke Williams and, and uh, you know all the guys that they've now brought up are are, are the definition of journeymen. Um, you know, they are not a, a good farm system. They're not a good organization at this point. And the problem is they're boxed in. There's no hope coming from the miners. There's no hope really coming in a way of a trade because you don't have the pieces to make a major move um, unless you're willing to maybe trade an Aaron Nola, and I don't see that happening. I mean, they're, they're just they're, – you know who they are, Mike? They're the Anaheim Angels. They really are in a lot of ways. Some marquee names, but you know they ain't going to win anything. Um. Let me ask you then about Dombrowski, you know, because he has one World Series. It's not like the guy's an idiot. I mean, he has a pretty good resume. But is this the right fix? Is this the right type of team for him to try to fix? You know, that's an interesting question. And, you know, I think if you put him and Joe Girardi on a little bit of truth serum, if they look at the situation now, compared to when they were making the decision to come here, I would be fascinated to find out how much has changed in their minds. When you kind of get below the surface and you see, wow, you know, you look at you know, this lineup and you have Real Muto and Harper and Hoskins can do some things. And now that you're kind of fully into it, do you see that it's a, a, a more complex situation, which it obviously is, than you possibly thought, and would it have changed their mind if they knew this in advance? I don't know. I mean, obviously the money is good for both of them. Um, and the challenge, you know, some guys thrive off the challenge, and I think Dave Dombrowski is not going to back down from it. But I, I, I think let's also be completely honest. It's not a it's not a quick fix situation. I mean, they are a they're two or three years away from maybe being two or three years away. Yeah, um, I agree with that, you know, because I will say I thought Clintac was way over his head. And Dombrowski, who I don't think is an idiot, I find that it's going to be a challenge for somebody who wants to build a winner to build a winner with this. Like, if you were to say, give me the first recipe for taking a step in the right direction, does that recipe even exist? Is that ingredient even here? 
and you're almost in that no man's land. You know, like I, I know you felt this with the NBA, and it's a little bit the same in baseball in a sense of you're not going to have that high end draft pick that you go that guy. You know, that that's the guy we're building for who's a top five guy. Obviously, in baseball, it's different anyway, but the Phillies are not bad enough to pick in that top of the draft order like they were 2016, 2017, when you're getting Mickey Moniak and, and Adam Hazley, which is really where the damage has been done here. I mean, you have two picks in the top 10 that you absolutely whiffed on. Uh, it's pretty difficult to overcome that when you're a bad team. Kevin uh, Kevin Cooney's with us, by the way, phillyvoice.com. He's got two really good stories about this Phillies uh, situation that is going up in the last week, so I encourage you uh, to check them out. Joe Girardi, all right, this one's interesting to me because I don't know that he has done a great job, to be fair, but we ran Kapler out because we thought he was the biggest problem. He's the problem with this team. Well, he's now got the best team in baseball. So is the, is the manager – the issue on this team. Let, let's also put it out there. Let, let's put let's put Gabe Kapler in the Hall of Fame in September. Okay, let's let's see. Second half Gabe has always been substantially worse than first half Gabe. True. So let's before we before we're throwing you know parades down Market Street in San Francisco. Let's hold off on on the Gabe issue. But we want to get on Girardi here. It's a roster issue. Um, you know, I don't know what manager could have done anything with that bullpen. Um, it, it, you know, I don't know what manager looks at that uh, could make a major difference with that center field situation that they had. You know, and having to go back to Odubel Herrera after kind of going around and around, uh, wanting to avoid Odubel Herrera um, for obvious reasons. I mean, I, I, the roster situation is the more alarming thing. Yeah. That being said, Mike, Joe Girardi has been a disappointment because, you know, I believe that teams that look that play tight often are a reflection of their manager. And this team often looks like it plays extremely tight and, and, and nervous and antsy and everything. It's not, it's not that they're too late back. I think it's almost the opposite. I think, you know, you see an Alec Bohm make an error at third base, and it's just a, it, it, it's a, it's a hyperactivity. And then you see what Girardi's done and the way Girardi's handled some of the off the field stuff. You know, the, the not wanting to talk about injuries and lineup decisions the way he did, and and snapping at the media for that, and and the whole Scherzer thing last week and uh, two weeks ago. Uh, you know, all of that, in my mind, is an indication of a manager that. Is just jumpy at this point. Yeah. And for a veteran who's coached in, who's managed in New York City, in the biggest pressure pot, uh, pot there is, the pressure poker there is, I, I, I'm really surprised by that at this point. I, could Joe already be fine? Yeah. Is he going to get fired? No. It, it's a matter of, Joe, take a, take a deep breath. You know, it, it made you look like you're having a little bit of fun for your money. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny because, as you mentioned, and I agree, like, I don't think Kapler's this great manager that they missed out on, like, you know, the Terry Francona situation where the team wasn't good, you let him go, he went to a good team and became a good manager. Uh, I, the question, I guess, is, and Girardi, here's a guy, as you just mentioned, he won a World Series. I guess is it the fact that the game is changing so much and it's like managers aren't managing as much anymore. The, the, the analytics have taken over. And where do the Phillies kind of sit in on that side of things? Are they an analytics team? Are they not? Are they stuck in the middle? Is that causing some of the problems? Or does it go back to they just don't have a very good roster? Well, let's also be honest. Joe did have a, a, a little bit of a... Yeah, it was called Binder Joe for a reason in New York. And... You know, part of what we see with the over-reliance on the bullpen, you know, if you want to go back to, to what happened with Eflin on, on, on Saturday and he's going into the bullpen, you're wondering, well, you know, Eflin looks great. He's out doing the ground. What are you doing? Well, that's Joe. That was Joe in New York. But Joe's problem was he had Patances and he had Rivera and he had Dave Robinson and all those guys he could turn to. Here he's turning to Nathalie Feliz, you know, who is, you know, to be blunt, 
not in and not in the majors for four years for a reason, and not just because of injury. I mean, this is this is one of those things in my mind, Mike, that he is he's trying to use the system that to play the hits that he had in New York, but it's a completely different band. Um, in your opinion, the way they've handled this Spencer Howard situation, what does that say? about the plan they have as an organization? I don't think they know what to do with Spencer Howard. I know now they're going to try, try to stretch him out again and try to make him a traditional starter. And, you know, they were so worried about the innings limit coming into the year and all this. I, 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 deep down, I wonder if they have any idea how to handle Spencer Howard. And part of that, honestly, has to fall on Spencer Howard. He does not look like he's in condition. And, and that's not, okay, you get to the fourth inning and your velocity trip, uh, drops and everything. It's like, you're going to tell me you're tired from running bases as a National League pitcher? I mean, really? <laughs> like, what, you know, I, I just, there's some guys who are able to command their own situations. And Spencer Howard doesn't look like that guy. And we're at, tw- you know, we're at 25 years old. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not like he's a kid anymore. Like, you know, you, you were the number one prospect in this organization. You know, time to put the big boy pants on. It's time to show that you were worthy of that title. And if you're not, then get out of the way. And, and, and But the problem is, he's not blocking anybody at this point. Like, who is who's the guy he's blocking yeah. in this organization? Adonis Medina is not exactly laying the world on fire either. Um. Isn't there maybe then another role for him? Like, have they not figured that out? Like, this guy obviously can help us. Maybe it's not the role we want. Our bullpen's a disaster. Should we find out if that's maybe what his role is? Remember when they, with Ryan Madsen, they put Madsen as a as a starter yep. there in, like, 2005, 2006, and he was lost. He was a four-inning, five-inning guy. And Rich Doobie finally kind of looked and said, I have enough, and he put him back in the, in the back end of the pen. And in, you know, in 07 and 08, he was the perfect setup guy for this team, along with J.C. Romero for, you know, Brett Myers at first, then obviously when he went in for Brad Lidge, in front of Brad Lidge in 08 and 09. Um, you know, could that be it? It could. Is there a value there? Absolutely. Uh, the problem is I... I, you know, we, we always had this argument with Vince Velasquez as well. And I think we all kind of figured out at some point, well, maybe there's a reason why the Phillies aren't necessarily focused on Vince Velasquez as a steady 7th, 8th, or ninth inning piece. And I had somebody in the Phillies organization go, he has trouble with the 1st and 2nd. What makes you think he can handle the 8th or the ninth? And it was like, that's a fair point. So I'm wondering, I'm not saying I've talked to anybody uh, 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 about Spencer Howard in this way. I'm not. But I'm saying that I that indication to me tells me that there's some people who wonder if he could handle that type of a late inning role. Um, and that's fair um, to say that, but to not no, it's totally explore fair. right to not explore it when he obviously he's pitched two good innings almost in every game and then falls apart in the third. Why? In, in my bullpen's a disaster. I don't know what to do with this guy. My bullpen thinks, why don't I say, hey, let's see if you can pitch in these situations. It can't hurt, right? It can't, but I, you know, I almost wonder. It's strange because they're a team that has nothing coming. They're not that dumb, and I, you almost wonder, like, okay, well, why, why are you, you know, playing for the future like this? You know, what you're not playing for the future necessarily. You're playing for now, right? But they make moves that make you feel like they're playing for the future in a long game here. And if that's the case, then then you're going to end up being at seventy-five to eighty-two wins and and staring at third or fourth place. That yeah, that that point there is is a very interesting one. Kevin Cooney makes you know that this team here, if their bullpen was half decent, is probably right in the thick of things, and they're still in the thick of things with this bullpen. If you had a young guy who can get people out, 
that you can't figure out what to do with him in the starting role, why not transition him into that role for this season? Worry about how to stretch him out in the offseason, get him on some different program, but to do what they're doing with him with this bullpen seems to be counterproductive. Now, that being said... Well, Mike, and, yeah. and, and Mike, and I'll also say this, and this sounds strange to bring this up. You have one month if you're this team to not just show your front office that you're worthy of making a move, which I don't know what they could do at this point. But you also have one month where you get the attention of your fan base. And I can't oversell this. You know, this is a team that, even with the pandemic ending, has struggled at the gate. And they struggled to kind of, yeah, they've, they, they've fallen the third in this city pretty easily. I think it's, it's fair to say. And you got one month until the Eagles hit training camp. And you got one month, basically, where you have the, the, the floor to yourself. If you lay an egg in this month, you are lost in this city. August and September, and even next year, trying to sell tickets for this team will be an impossible situation. And that has a trickle-down effect on your payroll and everything else going forward. Agree. Um, totally agree with that. Um, so, Kevin, why is this... You know, the immediate future of this franchise, as you mentioned, you know, you got to try to win them over. But this almost feels like a throwaway season. There is essentially – is there – there's essentially nothing this team can do, I feel like, right now to kind of start back over. You have the Harper deal, so you can't tell him, hey, we're going to strip this thing back down. You have the real Muto deal, so you can't strip it back down. You're paying Wheeler big – but you have essentially a team – that you're saying we're right there, but we're not close. We don't have any way to do it. So is this a throwaway year for Dombrowski just to oversee things and let contracts run out? It certainly feels like that in a lot of ways. Like Dave Dombrowski didn't get in until real late in the, in the, in the process in the off season. You also think about the idea that, you know, you didn't know what your pandemic limits were because of, you know, obviously Nobody was sure when they would have people back in the ballpark, uh, how many games they would play, what the, what the structure was going to be. The one complicating factor in that for next year is going to be what the collective bargaining agreement will look like, whether you'll have a DH. Um, but you will probably have a better field next year for what they are. And, uh, you know, and we're, they're going to go with Harper, with Real Mudo, and Wheeler kind of being your base, and then see what other role players kind of go around it. And if that's the case, then you're then you're kind of just lost in the wilderness for the rest of this year, whether you want to admit it or not. Feels like because they're not good enough. You know, you're not good enough right now. You know, Ruben Amaro was on Comcast on uh, on on Sunday, and he said it. They're not close to contending right now. You're not getting a wild card out of the National League East. I mean, if that's the case, then you know you're. You're kind of stuck. Totally agree there. And I'll, I'll leave you with this. You just said you're kind of stuck, but are they wasting playoff caliber starting pitching? Um, well, this week, sure. I mean, you know, but, you know, a month ago, Aaron Nola was, Aaron Nola was viewed as a number three, number four starter in a lot of eyes. I mean, so I, at the moment, yes. They are a playoff caliber rotation. Um, could that change in a hurry, though? Yeah, it could. And so, you know, that obviously proves that there's still some there's still some flaws that go beyond that, too. Uh, at Kevin Cooney, uh, phillyvoice.com. Check out that piece. And uh, you can follow him on Twitter for all of his stuff. And uh, he's a great follow. And uh, check out the uh, – a podcast, Working the Beat, him and Mike Kern. It's always an entertaining listen there as well. Um, boy, this Philly season has uh, gotten really interesting. And as you mentioned, they have about a month to grab our attention because there's a team uh, that doesn't have a lot of expectations getting ready to start in about a month, and, of course, they are the Eagles. Kevin, appreciate it and enjoyed it as always, man. Not a problem, Mike. And remember, the Eagles rule everything in this town, so it doesn't matter whether there's low expectations or not. So <laughs> That is right. That is right. And, and he's right, Kevin. I appreciate the time as always. Kevin Cooney, the Eagles do rule the roost. If they're a two-win team, a four-win team, an eight-win team, a 12-win team, or a Super Bowl team, the Eagles will always be at the top because their passion for football is just so huge.